All right, uh, thanks a lot for having me. I'm Patrick Brown. So I'm a postdoctoral research scientist at the Carnegie Institution uh, for Science right here on campus. And so in this talk, it's going to probably be a little bit different than a lot of the colloquiums uh, you've had because I am a climate scientist. So I'm not a computer scientist or an electrical engineer. So uh, you probably won't learn much about computer science or electrical engineering um, from me, but you'll at least hopefully uh, see a pretty good example of how other scientists in other fields use uh, the tools from computer science and electrical engineering to answer questions that they are interested in. So um, in particular, in this case, I'm interested in how much uh, global warming we're expecting to see uh, over the rest of the century. So um, the title of my talk is Combining Physical and Statistical Models in Order to Narrow Uncertainty in Projections of Global Warming. And uh, as was mentioned, this is uh, mostly a summary of results that we uh, recently published in Nature in an article called uh, Greater Future Global Warming Inferred from Earth's Recent Energy Budget. So I'm just going to kind of walk through my title here uh, as an outline. So <clears throat> what we're concerned here with are projections of global warming. And by global warming here, I mean the average surface air temperature of the planet. So the surface air temperature is the temperature of the air measured two meters above the surface and then averaged over the entire uh, surface of the planet. And this is a plot that I'll come back to a number of times, but this is observed temperature um, from the late 1800s up to 2016. And the 2017 number will come out tomorrow from NASA and NOAA, and it will be right, basically right on that uh, model mean that you're seeing there. And what we're seeing here is that we have this large fanning or this spread of uncertainty in terms of how much global warming we're expecting uh, through the remainder of the century. And so that will be... Uh, the main topic that I'm focused on. So before I get to that, I'm going to um, do a little background on the basic kind of physics of global warming and climate change science so we can understand where this uh, uncertainty comes from. And I'll talk about the physical models that are used to project global warming into the future. And when I say physical, I don't mean like a toy car that you hold in your hand or something. I just mean physical to distinguish it from statistical. So they're mostly based on physics. Uh, rather than just being um, empirical, statistical type relationships. Um, but then I'll talk about our work in particular, where we combine uh, information from these physical climate models with observations and with a statistical model to uh, potentially narrow uncertainty in the projections of global warming. So first, um, getting back to this uh, uncertainty in the projection of, of global warming. Uh, I just want to make the point that this is pretty uh, politically relevant because you have things like the uh, Paris uh, Agreement. Um, and it, you'll notice the language in the Paris Agreement, which essentially all the countries of the world signed and then we, uh, in a high profile move, uh, dropped out of the Paris Accord. But the language in the Paris Accord uh, talks about global warming in terms of global average surface air temperature, so exactly the variable that we're talking about here. So in particular, they say uh, the agreement aims to respond to, global climate to the global climate change threat by keeping global temperature rise this century well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And also, they want to pursue efforts to uh, limit temperature increases to below 1.5 degrees Celsius. So on this graph, I've uh, put in the 2 degree uh, Celsius limit. So Basically, what that means is that, yeah. So can you just say a word about anomalies versus average temperature? Yeah, so all of everybody gets confused about that unless you're really careful. Sure, so I've, I've zeroed all of these um, to a baseline earlier uh, in the century. So it's taking all the models and subtracting out the global average temperature from that model so that it essentially starts at zero. But the models do actually simulate a real temperature, because they're physical models. So they say the surface temperature is about 288 Kelvin. Um, but that's just getting subtracted out so that you're seeing everything relative to some zero baseline. And you can put that baseline anywhere. I just happen to have put it so that they essentially start at zero uh, back here. Um, <clears throat> so any, any uncertainty in the future projections of global warming will have political 
uh, consequences in terms of you know, how much we would have to reduce greenhouse gases in order to stay below any given uh, temperature uh, threshold. So, okay, so getting back to this fanning uncertainty, the first point I want to make is that most of this uncertainty doesn't actually have to do with the physical climate system. So most of the uncertainty has to do with what we call scenario uncertainty, and that has to do with these different colors. So these different colors are essentially scenarios of the future where we're imagining a given increase in greenhouse gases. And then the spread about any one of those given things tells us about the, the physical uncertainty. So the scenario uncertainty is going to have to do with technological changes and socioeconomic changes and population and various things like that. And so that is something that, you know, um, the geographers and demographers uh, look at trying to narrow uncertainty on, but that's not what we're focused on here. What we're focused on here is response uncertainty, is what we call it. And what that is, is, is basically trying to answer the question, how much global warming should we expect for a given increase in atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases? So that's like if you zoom in on any one of these scenarios, each one of these individual colors fixes the trajectory of increase in greenhouse gas concentrations. And then the spread about that, it's showing you um, different model calculations for how much warming uh, we should get when that trajectory of increase in greenhouse gases is held uh, constant. And so there's still a lot of response uncertainty. So the projections differ by approximately a factor of two. So the models that project the most global warming for a given increase in greenhouse gases project about twice as much uh, global warming as the models that uh, project the least. Can you explain what is RCP? Uh, yeah, so RCP, are, they're just called represent, representative concentration pathways. And all that means is that greenhouse gas concentrations are prescribed. So they're just defined ahead of time. And um, then the number next to that is the watts per meter squared forcing on the system that you get by the year 2100. So this RCP 8.5 means that we're defining ahead of time that we, we're going to have 8.5 watts per meter squared forced onto the climate system from an increase in greenhouse gases. Okay, so our basic question uh, how much global warming should we expect for a given increase in the atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases? So uh, I think it's helpful to think about this question just in terms of first principle um, physical equations, first principle thermodynamics. Um, so this is essentially comes from the first law of thermodynamics, uh, that we can think about the change in temperature of the surface of the planet. And I'm going to define it as delta T, so a perturbation from the equilibrium uh, value is related to the heat capacity of the system and then the net energy flux uh, imposed uh, upon that system. And so if we think about the climate system, we can kind of think about this equation in terms of just this 1D, you have the ocean, the atmosphere, you have a land surface, you have space. You think about where would the net energy fluxes come from? Um, in order to change uh, the climate. So there's some you know, geothermal energy, but very small. There's some energy coming from stars that are not the sun. But for the most part, it just has to do with um, this energy exchange at the top of the atmosphere that starts with uh, the sun. So coming in from the sun, uh, we have 340 uh, watts per meter squared. Some of that is reflected back to space by things like clouds. Um, and then some of that is reflected back to space by uh, things like ice on the surface, right? So any, or desert. Any, anytime you look at a picture of the Earth from space and you see light surfaces, you're seeing short wavelength radiation reflected back uh, to space. So about 100 watts per meter squared of the energy that comes in from the sun is immediately uh, reflected back to space, both from things in the atmosphere and from uh, the surface. And then the rest of it is absorbed by the surface. And so we know from uh, Planck's law that anything that has a temperature is going to radiate. And so uh, the Earth is radiating. But since it's much colder than the sun, it's radiating at a much longer wavelength. So we call this uh, infrared energy or uh, uh, we call it a bunch of things, heat radiation. Um, and so that is moving. Uh, to space, but of course that interacts with things in the atmosphere like water vapor and like clouds. 
Uh, water vapor and clouds actually make up 75% of the current uh, greenhouse effect of the Earth. So they, uh, they absorb this radiation and they re-emit it, and they make it harder for the Earth to radiate uh, this energy to space. But eventually it gets out there. And uh, so what you have is a situation in this case um, where you have about 240 watts coming in because I'm subtracting out the 100 that's um, being reflected and 240 leaving. So this would be a net flux of zero, right? So this would be no change in temperature uh, with time. But you can think about then how you would get a change uh, in temperature. And so what's going on currently is that humans are burning fossil fuels, and so they're adding carbon dioxide uh, to the atmosphere. And carbon dioxide interacts with uh, this long wave radiation coming from the surface of the planet, much more so than it interacts with short wave radiation coming from uh, the sun. And so it in introduces a, a perturbation where you're initially, as soon as you introduce carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, you're making the atmosphere optically thicker in terms of the infrared and you're, you are allowing less energy to escape to space. And so you've created a net energy flux then on uh, the system. And so it's, it's helpful to see where the uncertainty in the warming comes from um, if we break down this Q net flux term into two different terms. Um, and so what I've done here is I've broken it down into what's called a forcing in climate science and then a feedback uh, term. And so the feedback term is generally described by this lambda, which is called the climate feedback parameter. And so the uncertainty in the future projections of warming doesn't really come from this forcing. So introducing CO2, for example, into um, the atmosphere, if you double CO2 from, 300 and, uh, or from 280 parts per million to 560 parts per million, uh, we know what forcing that introduces onto the system pretty well. That's within narrow bounds of uncertainty. So it's about 3.7 watts per meter squared is what that does. But there's a lot more uncertainty when you think about what happens to the net flux, and it has to do with what feedbacks do. So as soon as you start warming up the planet, you're going to change a bunch of other things. So you can melt ice, which would change this flux. You can change clouds, which would change this flux and uh, this flux. You can increase, uh, you can change water vapor, which is going to change this flux. So all these other changes come in and introduce uncertainty in your warming rate because of this uh, feedback term. So uh, to get a better idea of that, we can imagine a situation in equilibrium and then solve this uh, for the change in temperature. And so basically what this says is that, okay, the change in temperature is related to uh, the forcing divided by this climate uh, feedback uh, parameter. And so there's a small uncertainty in general for the forcing, at least going into the future with CO2. Um, and there's a large uncertainty in this feedback parameter, which represents what all these other fluxes in the system do when you initially hit it with uh, forcing. And so that then bleeds into a large uncertainty in uh, the temperature. And so <clears throat> there are a number of ways that climate scientists try to uh, narrow uncertainty in this climate uh, feedback parameter. So I'll just kind of mention one and put it off to the side because it's not what our what our study looks at, but I think it's relevant to, to point out that this is kind of a whole other field of climate science, is that you can estimate um, the forcing and the change in temperature over time periods in the past and then try to get kind of an, an empirical um, idea of what this lambda is. So we have all these estimates of how temperature has changed in the past, um, and then we have estimates of how the forcings um, have changed in the past. So this is uh, estimates of temperature change using you know, what are called proxies in the, in the ge geologic record um, that, that vary with temperature. And so you can try to calculate temperature um, from variations in, uh, say, delta O18 in uh, water, in, uh, water column uh, drill holes, et cetera. Um, and so you have, you have these changes in temperature. This is over uh, 65 million years, over the past uh, 5.3 million years, over the past uh, 500,000 years. 
So these are the so-called Milankovitch cycles or ice age cycles. And so what you can do is you can say, okay, there's a, there's a change in temperature from the last glacial maximum from the last ice age to the present that we call the Holocene. Um, so we can put that in there and then we can estimate what the forcing change is from, from ge geologic evidence saying, okay, where the ice sheets were, we think they were like this and uh, we can measure from ice cores that greenhouse gases were like this and we can measure um, from other evidence, you know, what we think the aerosols uh, were looking like. And so then you can put that in there and then get an estimate of uh, climate sensitivity that way. So that's one way of doing things. But the other main way that I will focus on for the rest of this talk, the strategy two, is to increase greenhouse gas concentrations in a physical, mathematical uh, climate model and have it calculate based on our best, you know, physical understanding uh, of the climate system, how much uh, warming we should get. Um, so just some, some background on these uh, physical global climate models. So they're mathematical, mechanistic for the most part, uh, models of the entire Earth system that uh, in general need to be run on uh, supercomputers. So this is um, the Blue Fire supercomputer at NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, uh, in Boulder. And I think this um, is uh, 77 teraflops. And so I think when it was installed in 2008, it was like a top 25 uh, fastest computer. But of course, I think now it's orders of magnitude behind the fastest computers. Um, but these are the types of machines that these climate models are run on. And it's not necessarily, you know, because the of course, because the code is long or anything. So they're typically about a million lines of code, which is less than you know, an operating uh, system. But they are very computationally expensive. They require a lot of, um, obviously, a lot of calculations and a lot of uh, memory, which is why uh, we need to use these. Um, and so these climate models are developed at centers uh, all around the world. So this is just uh, a map of some of the most prominent uh, centers. So this is the one I just mentioned, National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder. And you have um, groups all around the world uh, developing models based on their own uh, best you know, understanding of how to move forward and they're kind of competing. Everyone wants uh, the best uh, model. And so the way these models work is they actually are modeling physically the entire Earth system. So the Earth system gets discretized uh, into horizontal and vertical uh, grids. And uh, basically just, you know, the laws of physics are used to calculate the state of the climate system uh, over time. So just, you know, some prominent uh, examples, you're going you're gonna to be calculating uh, the wind speed at every grid point in three dimensions uh, based on conservation of momentum. You're going to be calculating uh, the temperature based on conservation of energy. You're going to be calculating uh, mass. Uh, based on uh, conservation of mass, so density here. You're going to be calculating uh, water at any given location, and you're going to conserve water with the flow. Um, so all these things are just being calculated at each time step, and the time steps are about 30 uh, minutes. So these, you know, these equations get discretized, and then you just march forward uh, in time. And so you're simulating, it's kind of a misnomer to call them climate models because they don't simulate climate per se. They're actually simulating, you know, the weather because they're simulating output at every 30 minutes. And you can take that output and average it together and get climate just like you would in the real world if you're taking observations every 30 minutes. You'd average that together over 20, 30 years and get some climate. Um, the model is, is essentially doing um, the same thing. So uh, these models have become more sophisticated over time. So there are a number of processes that have been explicitly simulated uh, by the models has increased. So in the 70s, um, people were interested in, in global climate change uh, back then. So people were putting CO2 into physical models. Um, but back then, there wasn't even really, there wasn't a land surface or an ocean. There wasn't uh, clouds in the models because they're just too hard to model. Um, and so we've come a long way since then. So over time, uh, in the mid-1980s, we start putting in more, you know, the land surfaces and everything and, and putting in prescribed sea ice, meaning that it's not dynamic, it just has to uh, sit there. And eventually, this, these um, acronyms here correspond to Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports. 
So this FAR means first assessment report, so that's 1990, and then SAR is second assessment report, third assessment report, and then AR4 is fourth assessment report, um, because FAR was already taken. So this is, this is up to 2007, 2001, uh, 1995, 1990. But you can just see that over time, you know, now we have interactive vegetation. We're adding more and more things that may be important to, um, in terms of you know, actually calculating how much warming you'd get or how much change you'd get in, in anything um, as you increase uh, greenhouse gases. And then, of course, the spatial resolution has increased as well as computing power uh, has increased. So in 1990, this is what uh, Europe looked like in a typical climate model, so only a couple uh, pixels over the entire continent. And then we're still, for the most part, working with models that look more like this. So these global climate models really should be taken with a grain of salt when you're talking about any type of local projection, because the purpose of them is really to project global climate. And there's various ways of downscaling. You can take output from a global climate model and feed it into a, a, a high resolution model over a given location, so that's called dynamical down downscaling. Or you can feed it into some statistical model, and that's called statistical downscaling. Um, but for the most part, this is what global climate models still look like. A lot of them are uh, getting higher uh, resolution. And some are run at very high resolution. I'll just show you an example of that right now. But for the most part, over a short time period. Um, so this is uh, a video of a model out, model output from uh, NASA, and this is this is at like five kilometers resolution. So this is getting to the point where you're actually resolving uh, the clouds in in the model. And I think this is useful to look at, just because it gives you a sense of the type of emergent properties that the model is simulating. And it's um, this kind of shows you exactly why climate models are useful, because you have all these things in the system, like you have mid latitude cyclones spinning up. You have hurricanes that spin up. You have, so you can see the day moving across um, the surface of the planet. And every time it's day, you, you see you know, thunderstorms pop up in, the, in South America. Um, you have all these things. And it's important to realize that these are all just emergent properties of the, you know, the model. Like There's no code that says, uh, make hurricanes pop up and, and go over here, or there's no code that says make this circular twirl uh, happen on this day. That's all just coming about from the basic equations that are going into the model. And so that means that the model should have predictive capacity, right? So if you increase greenhouse gases in a climate model and it changes hurricanes, that wasn't begging the question necessarily, right? That wasn't a situation where you program the model to do something and then it did what you programmed it to do. What it's doing is actually a prediction. It's a prediction based on physics for the most part. Um, and so I think that's, that's one of the, the key takeaways of like why we would use these physical climate models is for uh, predictive uh, capacity. Totally off a set of initial conditions uh, predicted. Yeah, actually, so that's another, that's another important point to bring up. Is that, so in this case, this model, this is only over three months, right? Um, and this is just an atmospheric model, so it's forced with uh, sea surface temperatures that were as they were observed. So it's not actually, um, in this case, it's not simulating the ocean. It's, that's like a boundary condition on the model. So what the atmosphere does is not what we what actually happened. So these are real dates, 2005. Uh, this is so it's October 2005, and it's forcing it every day with the sea surface temperature that was observed. And the atmosphere does things similar to what the real atmosphere did over that time period. But because of the chaos in the system, you can't take any one of these, um, you know, situations too seriously. So like over the entire time frame, you can say, okay, what was the average precipitation? over this three month period and compare that to observations and you'll get like a pretty close answer which is interesting. But the day to day weather variability because that's part of the chaotic nature of the system, that's not something that should line up, that we expect to line up um, perfectly with observations. And even if you take the exact same model and you perturb temperature uh, in one grid point by 10 to the negative 14th or something and run that forward, you get different 
answers. So that that chaos is in is in the model as well. And so if you can't expect the model to reproduce observations if it can't even reproduce itself from such a tiny um, perturbation. But the longer time period that you average over, uh, the more the more fair it is to compare that to uh, observations. So the, up, the update was on daily, daily sea temperatures. Yeah. Of, of boundary, boundary value conditions, but everything else was run yeah. from the uh, yeah. ini initial conditions uh, predicted. Yep. Yep. And that, so most of the models I'm talking about are not, um, do not have a boundary, a sea surface temperature boundary. Usually, most of them have free running uh, oceans. And so the only boundary conditions that we're talking about in these projections of global warming are these increases in greenhouse gases, essentially. And so then the, the atmosphere is free running, the sea ice is free running, the ocean's free running, um, because obviously we can't prescribe, for example, uh, ocean temperatures into the future because we don't know what they are. Yeah? I don't know if it's an, <clears throat> an open question whether these extremes of weather that we've been observing are caused by the global warming, but is a similar weather pattern over the period observed in terms of the extremes in the model and in the real world? So I'm not um, explicitly involved in that level of research or that particular area of research, but my understanding is that they are pretty confident that like, for example, if you take Hurricane Harvey's rainfall totals and you look at um, a if you look at a model that was just run perpetually in uh, 1880 conditions, and you looked at like how often you get precipitation values at given thresholds, and you compare that to a model run in perpetual 2015 conditions, you do see an increase in these high-end precipitation events. And so that's, that's partially how they do the attribution, is they say, they do like an odds ratio, they say like, uh, you know, a precipitation event over 25 inches occurs, you know, one out of however many years in the, in the previous climate state. And it, it's the odds increase by a given percentage in the new uh, climate state. Essentially just because you have, um, as the earth gets warmer, and so we know it's gotten warmer over that time period, you have a higher capacity of like moisture in the atmosphere. And so you can have, you can actually have nonlinear responses where the, you know, the temperature is only increased by less than a percent. If you think about absolute temperatures, like 288 Kelvin has increased to 289 Kelvin. But um, you get these nonlinear responses in, in moisture convergence because of um, nonlinear non uh, functions in the climate system, like clausius clapeyron which is exponential to temperature. Well, measuring it in Kelvin really doesn't, that expands the range quite a bit because it never gets down to zero Kelvin on Earth. <laughs> right, right. Really, you should look at it between maybe, you know, Minus 10 centigrade and, and 60 centigrade is the entire range. Right, but I'm saying yeah, when they do, when they run the models, they're only looking at that small range. Um, right. Yeah. 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 But I think wasn't your question more uh, aimed at stuff like the ridiculously resilient ridge and the jet stream funnies and that kind of stuff? Right. Yeah. Okay. So I think there's some recent stuff on uh, less sea ice, and I think Noah Diffenbaugh has some stuff about that. You yeah. Know, that, that, seems to be pretty coherent with, with those effects um, jiggling the jet stream worse and, you know, giving us what we just have seen. Yeah, so the team at Stanford has have been kind of pioneers in that, that mm -hmm. they're, um, what their research shows is that when you decrease sea ice in uh, the Arctic, that lessens the temperature gradient between the middle latitudes and the Arctic, and that has an effect on the jet stream where it essentially gets wavier, and so you have more extreme events um, because of a wavier jet stream. I know that that is disputed by other groups, so that's still kind of an active area of research that people um, are looking at. Which, which did you say are like, you gave an example of a nonlinear thing, but are there several nonlinear effects, or what are they? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the, so I mentioned clausius clapeyron so as uh, you increase temperature, you get an exponential increase in the saturation vapor pressure, meaning that the atmosphere, meteorologists say, holds more uh, moisture. It's not atmosphere doesn't hold moisture, it's more just that when the temperature is, is higher, um, you can have more moisture before it condenses and rains out. So that's probably the most prominent one in terms of, um, you know, importance to the, to calculating future warming because 
uh, water vapor is a greenhouse gas. Right. Um, but you have, you know, you have nonlinear in the other direction too. So CO2, for, for example, saturates. Uh, so that's why we measure in terms of doubling. So each like doubling of CO2 has an equivalent forcing on the system um, rather than it being like an exponential. So you look all over and you see, um, you see nonlinearity uh, all over the place. And some of it's, you know, there's not, they're not actually equations that are going into the model. It's like you could have a nonlinear collapse of the ice, the, the Arctic sea ice, which we saw in 2007. And that would be some emergent thing that happened because of all sorts of uh, processes working together. And so that's another reason why we want to run these models is we want to see like, you know, it's, it's easy to say, well, CO2 saturates so it won't get uh, that warm. And then someone else says, yeah, but Clausius Clapeyron is in the other direction. So you actually have to run the numbers, right? You try to run the numbers and see what, what the result uh, is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when I curved it to the Clausius Clapeyron, it ends up at about 7% uh, increase in water vapor content at equilibrium per degree C. Mm -hmm. And it gets worse as it gets warmer. Yeah. That's my understanding too. And Seven percent. So that that to me was mind blowing. Yeah, yep. And um, what's interesting about that is that the atmosphere holds seven seven percent more um, moisture, but the um, well, I won't get. Into that. I was gonna I was gonna get into a thing about how about why extremes increase, but I think that's too too far afield here. But yeah, that is that is a that is a very um, it can be a you know, mind-boggling thing in terms of <laughs> how much uh, change you get for a small amount of uh, temperature increase. OK, so going back to what the models um, in general look like now, if you want to run them for a long period of time, uh, like hundreds of years, uh, we have this type of resolution. And so what that means is that the spatial resolution is not sufficient to resolve uh, many important processes in the climate system. And so those processes then have to be parameterized uh, in the model, we call it. And what a parameterization essentially is, is that you're calculating something um, based on some algorithm or some formula that's only really semi-physical and is mostly kind of empirical or statistical. And it has tunable parameters in it that are uh, pretty poorly uh, constrained. And so an example of a parameterization like this would be a cloud fraction. So what the model wants to do is it wants to calculate, say, the cloud fraction over uh, this grid cell in uh, Ireland. And so what it does in order to do that is it can't just say, oh, when relative humidity is 100%, there's a cloud. Because over that, that space is too big, right? So the relative humidity isn't going to be 100% over that entire space. So it has to take in information about relative humidity and a bunch of other information from uh, different um, other you know, physical variables, and then calculate what the, what the fraction of cloud should be over that uh, grid box. And as you can imagine, this is a relatively difficult thing to do, and there's a lot of uncertainty. And so I'll just show you, this is just some code for, for the cloud fraction sub, subroutine in the uh, community or system model, which is that model developed at NCAR that I, that I mentioned. You notice the code is in Fortran, so most climate, model, most climate models are still run in Fortran, I think, just for legacy purposes that they were originally, originally written in Fortran, and uh, people share modules and things like that all the time, and so Still written in Fortran. Um, but you see it, you know, here in some comments, this calculates cloud fraction using relative humidity threshold, uh, pressure, presence or absence of uh, convection is defined with regionally large vertical mass flux, et cetera. You see, okay, set Wang and Sasson uh, parameters. So you have these ABC uh, parameters uh, here, set uh, Schiller parameters. So these are the types of things that are important in terms of what the actual module is going to do for calculating cloud fraction. But they're not really physical. You can't really go out and measure them. And so they're very uncertain. Um, and so this is where this uncertainty essentially comes from as far as the models are concerned, is that different models make different decisions on how to best parameterize these subgrid scale processes that then have big effects on the radiation budget and then how much uh, warming you get 
uh, in the future. So most of the uncertainty in future warming from these different models comes from uncertainty in the feedbacks, so how the other fluxes in the energy budget change after you've changed, um, say, CO2 concentrations. And that uncertainty comes from um, these, a lot of these important processes being parameterized in the model without like a really good way of figuring out um, what the best value is for those parameters. Yeah. Are these parameters independent? Or are they all interrelated? So that when you alter one, you know, all the knobs move in different directions. Uh, my understanding is for the most part they are independent. So you can, you can move them independently from each other. And so, you know, some projects uh, do that is that they just take one model and instead of running a bunch of different experiments or whatever, their main goal is to just run one experiment but to perturb all the different parameters uh, differently, you know, at different times and see what that does uh, to the spread. I think I would say... One man's constant is another man's variable. You're right, exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I work on these models. <laughs> okay, so getting back to then our study in particular, is the primary goal of our study is to narrow this range of uncertainty and to um, assess whether the upper or lower end of that range uh, is more likely. And you can get an idea of, of how we can do that. Um, based on this discussion of, of where this uncertainty comes from. So the idea that we um, utilize here is that the physical models that are going to be the most skillful in their projections of future warming and thus have the most accurate parameterizations, right? they should also be the most skillful in other contexts like simulating uh, the recent past. And so you can, since these models are kind of in their own physical reality, they're not necessarily pinned to observations in any meaningful way. Um, you can evaluate them against observations of the recent past to see how well uh, they are doing. <clears throat> and so what we use is what gets called the emergent constraints uh, paradigm. And what that says is that if there's a relationship between how physical models simulate the recent past, where you have observations, and how much warming they simulate in the future, then you should be able to use this statistical relationship, along with observations of the recent past, to statistically constrain or narrow uh, that range of uncertainty in future warming. So just to kind of illustrate that, um, the idea is you have something that you can observe currently, which ends up being our predictor variable, and you have a bunch of climate models that simulate that variable uh, differently. So you have spread in those climate models. And the, the spread actually is what is where the emergent, the word emergent comes from here. Is that what, what they're saying is that because different climate model modeling centers make different choices in how to parameterize uh, different uh, processes in the model, you just get this emergent spread in how it will simulate uh, various things. And then you want to relate that to something that you want to know, but you can't observe. So in our case, it's how much warming we're going to get uh, in the future. So if, the, if all the models lined up like this, it would mean that, okay, the models have different parameterization choices, et cetera. Um, and so that matters for this predictor variable. But apparently it doesn't matter at all for this predictand. Um, so that would mean that our predictand is, is pretty well constrained and it doesn't matter how these uh, different choices are. Are made. But for the most part, you'll see different um, relationships. So, for example, if you see a relationship like this, then you have spread in both uh, the predictor, something you can currently observe, and the predictand. And so that's not very useful, right? Because then you, then you can look at, let's say, okay, here's what our observation of what this predictor is, but that doesn't help us constrain at all the uncertainty in the predictand. So that's not what we're looking for. What we're looking for is something with a essentially a strong uh, statistical relationship. So you have something that you can observe currently and that is across models related to this thing that you can't observe, the predictand. So again, in this case it's how much warming we expect uh, in the future. And so if you have something like this, then you can use this relationship and say, okay, observations are here. 
And so that means that the models that are closest to observations are telling us something <coughs> in terms of what our predictand is. And it's the case, or it's hopefully the case, that then if we use this, uh, this value, this observationally informed central estimate for our predictand, that will be better than just taking an average of all of the models. So it's the idea of, of kind of, of ending model democracy, where <laughs> instead of just throwing all the models together and averaging them together and saying the best estimate is the average of all the models, it's saying, no, we can do better than that. We can, we can use observations and this relationship across models to try to get a better estimate of what uh, the, predict the predictand actually is. So in this case, the amount of uh, future warming. So, uh, so we know what our predictand is. That's the amount of future warming. And then we're interested then in what should we use as predictor variables. So going back to our uh, energy budget diagram, remember there's large uncertainty in temperature because there's a large uncertainty in the feedback parameter. And the feedback parameter comes from all of these different energy fluxes. Um, so it makes sense to use as the predictor variable, especially if you're interested in getting at how these parameterizations might affect uh, these feedbacks. It makes sense to use as your predictor variable um, these actual fluxes. So we use outgoing shortwave radiation, uh, we use outgoing longwave radiation, and we use um, the difference between the two, so the net, uh, the net downward oriented energy flux, which is just the incoming shortwave radiation minus these two, so it's the net down. Uh, so we use these three variables, and then we look at them uh, on different uh, time scales as well. So we look at the mean, what's called climatology, which is just the average of those values <laughs> over a time frame. Um, and we look at this at every single location in space. Uh, we look at the magnitude of the seasonal cycle, so the standard deviation of the average uh, seasonal cycle in these variables. And we look at the magnitude of monthly variability. So if you take out the seasonal cycle and you just do a temporal standard deviation of those time series, which are monthly resolution, um, what's, the, what's the magnitude of that? So with these uh, three variables and three attributes, we have nine uh, predictor fields, uh, we call them. And so just to give you an idea of what these look like, these are model uh, averages for these nine predictor fields. And so we take these then and we use satellite observations uh, over this time period of the recent past where we have good observations. So this is from the series uh, satellite record, Clouds and Earth's Radiant Energy System satellite record, which um, is an instrument that flies on the Terra and Aqua satellites uh, run by uh, NASA. So that's where our observations come from. And I'll just toggle here and show you, here's observations, here's model mean, here's observations, here's model mean, observations, model mean. And so you can see that the models do a pretty good job of getting the large scale patterns right, which is good news. And depending on your, um, if you're an optimist or a pessimist, uh, you might think that that's pretty impressive uh, or not. So I'm kind of an optimist, so I think that is pretty impressive, that these, these patterns, that here's the models and here's observations, the fact that they get these large scale patterns correct again, is impressive because it's not programmed into the model explicitly. It's just an emergent um, property of the underlying uh, physical equations. But of course, some models do better than others, and that's what we're trying to exploit here uh, in the research. And so we do have kind of a, a statistical problem, though. So if we think about, we have nine, nine predictor fields, but let's just focus uh, for a second on one, and ask the question then, what method is appropriate to statistically relate the predictor uh, to the predictand? So we have this situation like this, where we have a predictor variable, which I'll call x here, and we have um, a number of models. So in this particular case, we have 36 models. And so each one of these, I've bilinearly interpolated them to a very coarse grid compared to their native grid, but there's still a lot of points. So we have 72 longitudes and seven, or 37 uh, latitudes. And so we're trying to relate all of these predictor variables uh, 
to a predict dan, which is just one value for each model. That's how much warming uh, you get uh, in the future. And so what we have here is that there's way more predictors um, than variables to actually predict. Uh, and the predictors themselves are going to be correlated with each other because in, you know, in geospatial um, fields, you almost always have a lot of autocorrelation uh, between uh, grid boxes. And so what we use is essentially a, a method that's designed for this situation um, where we relate the predictors to the predictands using partial least squares uh, regression, which was invented by uh, Wold in 1966. And so um, to give you an idea of, of how this works, we can think of this like it's a multiple linear regression problem where the predictand here is the y value and the, the predictor uh, matrix is x here. And you're trying to find B coefficients such that they minimize this residual, right? And so if you look at this, this matrix, if we unwrap the predictor variables in space and just put them um, in one dimension, so uh, here uh, 37 by, times 72 locations is uh, 2,664 locations, and you have 36 models this way, so the, and this, this is the actual variable, outgoing shortwave radiation. You have um, a situation that's not <laughs> appropriate for multiple linear regression um, because the system is way underdetermined, right? There's more, there's 2,664 uh, unknown coefficients uh, and only 36 uh, equations. And each column in this matrix is highly correlated with other columns in the matrix, right? Just because of they're close in space. This location one and location two are going to be right next to each other, and if you regress them against each other, you get almost a, a perfect correlation. Um, so that means the matrix is well below uh, full rank. So what partial least squares regression does is it essentially solves this problem by creating um, columns that are linear combinations of the original column, which are orthogonal or uncorrelated to each other, um, but explain as much of the variability in the predictand uh, as possible. So we essentially replace this system with um, 2,664 uh, locations with a new system <coughs> where we have just a handful of partial least squares components, they're called, or latent variables. Um, so in this case, we tend to use seven uh, components, but you could use as, as few as three um, and get a similar... Uh, results. And so that, that essentially solves our problem of, of having more, way more predictors than predictand uh, variables um, and then also having very uh, highly uh, collinear uh, columns in that, in that original uh, matrix. Um, so however, it is really important to guard against uh, overfitting in this procedure. So the PLS Partially squares regression procedure is more than capable of overfitting predictors uh, to predict DANs. So what we do to guard against that is um, evaluate the skill and also the constrained, the narrow, the, how much we're narrowing the uncertainty in future warming um, using uh, leave one out uh, cross validation. So what that essentially is is we're taking we're taking our linear combination of PLS components here. So it would have to be a linear combination to project this into two dimensions. Um, but just bear with me. It wouldn't actually be in two dimensions, but you can just visualize it like this here. Um, so that's our predictor variable. And then we have our predict and how much warming we're expecting in the future. And so in this case, this would be like an observation and then our observationally informed prediction. Um, but with leave one out cross-validation, what we're doing is we're taking each model in turn and we're saying, okay, this is the test model. We're going to pull this out of the procedure. We're going to do the PLS um, regression on the rest of the models. So that's going to change this um, actual statistical relationship. And then we're going to pretend like this test model is essentially observations. So we're going to say, okay, let's, uh, let's imagine that this test model is what observations are. And then let's make a prediction of our predictand based on what this test model says for its predictor. So that gives us a, a prediction here. 
And in, if this was real observations, we'd just be stuck at that. We'd say, okay, that's our prediction. We don't know if it's gonna come true. But with a test model, we actually know what the value is, right? So we have what the actual value is for this model. So then we can measure what the error is between what the statistical relationship said and what the model actually uh, predicted. Um, and again, of course, the, the statistical relationship has to be blind to that model, has to be pulled out um, so that the regression coefficients aren't using that model. So then we can do that with every single model in the ensemble and get a distribution of uh, errors. And that is going to inform how well we think this procedure uh, narrows uncertainty in uh, future warming. And so the way that we summarize that is what we call a spread ratio, where the spread is just the spread about the, the predictand. Um, and so what that is is just a root mean square of all of these prediction um, errors uh, for each model divided by what the root mean square error is if you just use the model mean every single time. So if you just, every single time you guessed the model mean and you took that as the error, that's what we're comparing it to. Um, and so if we get a spread ratio below one, that means that the partially squared regression procedure is doing better than um, not using it, doing better than just using the model mean um, as your best uh, estimate. And so that, that's how some of our results that I'm about to show you are summarized with the spread ratio. Below one means um, that it's essentially working. And then the other part of the results um, are the prediction ratio, which is just what the ratio is between the observationally informed prediction of future warming and what the model mean would tell you. So if that's above one, that means that observations along with the statistical relationship <coughs> together are uh, giving you a prediction of global warming that's larger than um, what the, what the multi-model mean would tell you it would be. Okay, so I'm gonna show you um, results, uh, prediction ratio and uh, spread ratio. Uh, and this is as a function of number of PLS components used. And I'm showing here the basically this is kind of a this is a plot from the figure that was supposed to um, be you know like convincing to reviewers because we're showing you all of the all of the information, um, but it's you know it's not great for a presentation like this. But uh, what what it's essentially showing is that no matter which predictor you use, or we also vary the predictands um, diff for different uh, time periods and different scenarios. No matter how you switch that, and no matter how you um, decide how many PLS components to use, uh, you tend to get spread ratios below one, meaning that you are uh, that you are actually increasing the skill of your prediction relative to just using uh, the model mean, and you tend to get prediction ratios uh, above one, meaning that the observations are telling us in conjunction with the statistical relationship that uh, we should expect more warming in the future than we would otherwise if we were just looking at the models by themselves and ignoring observations. And you see that um, this saturates at about, for the prediction ratio, this saturates at about 1.15, meaning that we're expecting about 15% more warming based on our results uh, than we would uh, otherwise. And so overall what this plot is showing you is that observations of several diverse attributes of the Earth's energy budget um, indicate both individually, which is what I'm showing over here, and collectively, which um, that's basically taking all of the predictors and using them simultaneously in the PLS uh, regression procedure. That both individually and collectively, global warming is likely to be greater than that suggested uh, by the unconstrained uh, model suite. So to give you an idea of what that looks like in terms of a uh, actual projection, uh, so here is uh, the most uh, severe uh, projection of global warming for in terms of this is the largest imagined increase in greenhouse gases of the various scenarios. So this is that RCP 8.5 scenario. And this is what the raw model spread uh, 
uh, is about that. And so we have observations of global temperature uh, here, and then this is all smoothed, which is why it comes to a point here that's like the smoothing is the same um, time scale as the uh, time period that's used to zero, um, zero observations and, and models. Uh, so we're just looking at the spread into the future. This is what the raw climate model projections show. And then this is what our projections look like with the observationally informed uh, information and then that spread informed using uh, the cross validation. And so I think one um, point that's worth uh, bringing up here is that it's sometimes argued, you'll see you know, quite a bit on TV or even in front of Congress, um, that projected global warming uh, should essentially be taken less seriously on the grounds that climate models don't accurately simulate the current climate system. And what our work shows is that there is a lot of room for climate model improvement. I mean, we see a lot of, quite a bit of discrepancy between observations uh, and models. But our results suggest that model shortcomings really can't be used to dismiss the most severe projections of global warming because we're showing that the models that do the best in the current climate system project more warming in the future than the average model. So if anything, our results suggest that, that model shortcomings can be used to dismiss these least severe uh, projections of global warming. Um, so I'll just quickly show one thing about physical mechanisms because we want to um, understand, you know, what I've shown so far is kind of a black box. You just take a predictor and you, um, you relate it to a predictand and it gives you uh, an answer but you don't know why. But something that's useful with the PLS procedure is you can get an idea of the physical mechanisms uh, going on. And so one, one way to do that is, I'll just focus here on this outgoing shortwave radiation uh, mean climatology predictor is you can look at these, what are called PLS loadings. And I won't get into exactly how these are calculated, but what this map means, it, positive values are locations where models with more outgoing shortwave radiation uh, warm more in the future. And negative values are mod mean that at, at these locations, models with more outgoing shortwave radiation warm less in the future. So you would get a map very similar if you just went grid box by grid box and calculated the local correlation coefficient between outgoing shortwave radiation across models and the amount of uh, warming that models simulate in the future. Um, and so this, this tells us some information, especially when we add on observations. So the contours are the satellite observations where um, relative to the multimodal mean, where the, uh, pos or the solid contours are uh, positive and the dotted contours are negative. And so you can see that the observations, um, it's definitely not perfect, but they, uh, they match essentially what the pattern is. They project positively onto that pattern um, that you see from the, from the models. And so just to give you an idea of how we can use this to figure out what's going on, we see that, for example, over the Southern Ocean, um, the models that warm more tend to reflect more sunlight back to space. And so that would mean that models that warm more in the future have more clouds over the Southern Ocean and or more sea ice. And so that makes sense physically why this would matter for, for warming in the future, just because of potentials. So if, I think that it's easiest to think about sea ice. So if you have a model that in the current climate state has a lot of sea ice, that means that as you increase the temperature in the future, there's a lot of sea ice to melt. And as you melt more sea ice, you're reflecting less solar radiation back to space and you're absorbing more. And so it would make sense that models with more sea ice to begin with can melt more and then can have a more positive uh, feedback uh, on warming. And we see that it also makes sense for shortwave cloud feedbacks. This actually happens to be an area of, of negative cloud feedback in the models. But what that means still is that if you have more um, shortwave radiation reflected back to space in your base state, then you have less potential for a negative um, cloud feedback uh, in the future. And so these both you know, lend themselves to physical explanations as to why these predictors then actually work as, uh, as 
uh, being able to narrow the range of future uh, projected warming. And so then observations tell us, since they project positively onto that, tell us that models with more outgoing shortwave radiation over this southern hemisphere region uh, are correct. And so then that would um, statistically then can be inferred that the models that warm more uh, are likely to be correct. Okay, so just um, to summarize all that, back to my uh, title of combining physical and statistical models in order to narrow uncertainty in projections of global warming. We have all these physical global climate models that are um, you know, calculating all these things three-dimensionally in space and stepping forward in time and trying to uh, give us an understanding of the emergent properties uh, of the system. And then we're combining that. Um, that you know, they have a lot of uncertainty in how much warming uh, we're expecting in the future, largely because of uncertainty in these parameterizations that affect how feedbacks work in the system. So we're then going to use observations of the Earth's energy budget, which should be related to how well models parameterize various aspects of the climate system. Uh, we're going to use that along with a statistical relationship um, across models to try to inform uh, future projections of global warming. And so what we find is that we can get a narrowing of the spread, so constrain that uh, uncertainty, and that observations tell us that it's more likely that um, the models that are projecting more warming in the future are uh, likely to be uh, correct. So um, if anyone's interested in reading more about that, this is the, the name of the paper uh, again, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, so about 20 years ago, uh, I was helping sell supercomputers to the NCAR folks and had a, spent a day with them. Right? And they characterized the challenges to getting uh, better models as a mix of um, science basically being parameterizations, uh, data availability, and then the third was compute power. And I said, well, I can help you with one of those. <laughs> yeah. right. um, can you sort of talk about the other two in terms of is there data? more data that people wish they had? Are there worries about getting enough data? And then how are the parameters, you, you know, what you're going at is which the parameterizations are better or not. Mm -hmm. So can you sort of in that framework talk yeah. about? Yeah. Um, so I don't have a lot of explicit knowledge of how the parameterization schemes are developed. So, you know, we're kind of coming in at, at the high level and saying, okay, you know, which ones seem to be uh, the best. But of course, there's all these you know different groups of scientists that spend their entire careers just on one on one thing. Um, so I guess I would I would refer um, to talking to them about how exactly they make those choices. Uh, in terms of data, yeah, we wish we had so much more so data. What, what particular data sources do you wish you had that would help you do this better? Well, so longer records would be a lot better. So we're using this satellite record. Um, from 2001 to 2015, mm -hmm. and there may be reasons why um, that could be unrepresentative of, of if you were going to take uh, statistics over a longer time frame. So we have like decadal, there's decadal level chaos in the system, like um, internal modes of variability like the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation or the Pacific decadal okay. oscillation. These things that uh, change over multiple decades in the ocean. And so if you just look over a time period of 15 years, mm -hmm. you could easily be catching mm -hmm. the system in a given state that then the models don't represent that. Not because there's anything wrong with the models, but because they happen to not be in that state at that time. And so then in our results, that would feed into um, you know, the actual then projections of warming is because you're, you're downgrading a model when it didn't deserve to be downgraded, essentially. And so we'd love to have more um, longer data sets, which means going into the future that we need to continue to, you know, fund uh, Earth observing system things. Yeah, the NCAR guys said they'd love to have a few thousand years of satellite observations, yeah. but they weren't likely to get them. <laughs> that would be amazing, yeah. And especially, be, like, we don't know, you know, what the forcings were uh, going mm -hmm. back in time. Um, and so we have to, you know, infer that. And so if you had satellite observations, that, that would be helpful uh, <laughs> uh, along, that, along those lines. Uh, well, well. I, I had a chance to talk to Keeling when he came to Caltech once to give a talk. Oh, yeah. And he talked about both, you know, trying to extrapolate things from uh, 
ice cores and tree rings. I brought up some ice cores myself, actually. And uh, you know, all kinds of other things, which you actually did very nicely touch about early on about surrogates for information. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a huge, it's a <coughs> huge topic. I mean, yeah. Know, we'll ask in six months to do other similar kinds of things. Right. We'll take I mean, Alice not here, too. But, yeah. You, know, you can grab people and go up there and you scratch our heads. Yeah, it would be it would be great to have you know independent long term uh, records that like because all these proxies are again right. tuned to observations over the recent past because you have to have some statistical relationship. Sure. Between well, it's not just that too, but also you know most people who think about weather and climate also have this big bias to the land. Right. And yeah, sure. um, one of the oceanographers I dealt with when I was in grad school, he showed me all the ship tracks, and you know. Very little ship traffic happens in the southern hemisphere. Yeah. And yeah. the United States Navy also takes a very dim view of satellites or flying oceans. Okay. <laughs> no, they, they, yeah. they actively uh, are against uh, any sort of remote sensing of oceans that they don't control. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's another control. Yeah, yeah. political uh, thing to consider. Yeah. Keep an eye out. Naomi Oreskes is doing, working on a book, um, sort of that relates to that. Yeah. No, I talked to the people actually down at FNOC and uh, NRL West down in Monterey. And like one of my old NASA buses goes, "There's no supercomputers in Monterey." And I go, "Yeah, that's what you think." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a a friend who's a, a brilliant engineer. I have tremendous respect for him. And he spent the last 15, 20 years wondering about an aspect of the global warming crisis, which is, might there be a space-based solution for intercepting the sun's rays? There have been things about orbiting the Earth. He's talking about planting solar sails at the Lagrange point as a way of cutting back a quarter percent, half percent, one percent of the sun's radiation before it ever reaches the Earth. Mm -hmm. That may or may not be practical. I think he just enjoys the idea of putting things through. But his argument is that these models are so complicated, it could simplify things to cut to the chase, look for some empirical evidence of what has happened to global climate when there has been a historic cutback. And he's pointing to something called the Wander Minimum, which I have never heard of otherwise. Are you familiar with this thing that happened in the yeah, yeah. hundreds of years ago? Yeah. The idea is there were a lot of sunspots that was observed at the time that would have had the effect of cutting back the sun's heat based on sunspot coefficients and what happened to the Earth's climate during that period, how did the temperature drop. That seems like a very simple, maybe simplistic approach to not worrying about all these dozens of individual coefficients. But do you think there's any grounds at all to trying to argue from that vantage point? Well, you can, so, you know, that one equation that I showed that's just the, you know, first law of thermodynamics, like you can essentially make a climate model like that out of one equation. And so people, people run the gamut in terms of like climate models that are one equation up to these millions of lines of code uh, models. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily the case that these are the only things that are studying uh, the climate system. People definitely go with uh, much simpler models as well. Um, in terms of the, the modern minimum, which, uh, so that was, yeah, minimum in, uh, in the 1700s that we think uh, there was less solar output during that time and temperatures also cooled during that time uh, quite dramatically. Um, that actually, if that is, if temperatures cooled as much as they did and it was because of the sun reduction, um, that actually has, that's bad news for how much warming we'd expect in the future because you can always convert, you, so you can convert the change in solar energy to a watts per meter squared forcing just like you can look at the change in CO2 as a watts per meter squared forcing and then look at that temperature that, res that resulted from that. And so if you have a small change in solar activity, and we don't think the actual flux from the sun varied very much, but you have a large change in temperature, that means the system's very sensitive to changes in forcings because you're going to have positive feedbacks amplifying that. Um, but of course, when you're looking over the 1700s, the data is, is not great. You don't know what the actual flux change was in the sun. You're trying to approximate it from uh, sunspots, and we only have, so we have a couple decades of sunspot records, and we can see the 11-year solar cycle, but we, know, we don't know if that um, 
you know, 11 year solar cycle corresponds to long term changes in sunspots. So you don't know what the forcing was, and then you don't know really what the temperature change was within strong um, boundaries because you're using proxies from tree rings and corals <coughs> and ice cores and things like that. So it's not as simple as that. In terms of geoengineering, that is a very um, relevant area of research that, that my uh, advisor is, is very much in, Ken Caldera. Um, and so, yeah, there's a bunch of, there's many. Um, proposals as to how we could uh, offset the, in, the heating influence from increasing greenhouse gases. And I have heard of that. Other people suggest uh, aerosols up in the stratosphere to reflect solar radiation, et cetera. Um, but yeah, so that's, that'd be something, one problem with that is that you have to do that continuously because CO2 just accumulates in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So if you do something like that, like you're spraying aerosols up into the stratosphere, that has to be going on continuously and if 50 years down the road, 100 years down the road, we don't do it anymore, those things fall out in a matter of years, and then the temperature spikes up to where it would be otherwise. And so that's, you know. What you're describing is several different approaches that would be basically Earth-based in Earth orbit or the immediate vicinity of Earth. And this philosophy is if you could put something at the the range point. Oh, I see. What you're okay. And have it stay there, and have it be solar sails that could maintain their position and move as necessary. Then it would be a space junk. Remarkable engineering. I'm I'm open to hearing more. <laughs> but the problem is, if you look at the data, particularly the most recent IPCC stuff, it's pretty strong belief that a lot of the coolness of that time was from heavy duty volcanic activity. It was also a approximately 10 parts per million drop of CO2 in, going into 1600 um, that probably came from the 50 million person die off in the Americas. Okay, right? and there's a unique drop in CO2 that happens 1525 to 1600, all right? But the volcanic stuff you know, has been better calibrated now and looks like more of it. And, you know, there's this claim by this lady, Zarkova, that there's a big solar minimum coming, you know, in 2030 or something, but every time people look at it, it just unfortunately doesn't make that much difference. We, we might, might inhibit, we might cancel global warming for a decade or so, you know, that's right. it. Thanks, John. After 20 years, I have some way to answer him the next time. You yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he needs to look at the forcing diagrams uh, in the in, uh, IPCC AR5, because they go into that in quite a bit. Uh, <clears throat> I'm wondering if any of this could be teased out of uh, from deconvolving the uh, injection of sulfur dioxide through the Pinatubo and other volcanic and, uh, eruptions that, that might, be, might be local before it's totally distributed. But. Yeah, um, so that's another, that's another thing that people do to try to get at this uh, feedback parameter, is that I, I mentioned the, uh, the long-term changes Let's show you real quick. So I, I mentioned the paleoclimate changes, that you can look at some change in um, temperature and some change in forcing over these long time scales and try to get at this feedback parameter. But that the Pinatubo thing is, a, is another thing that people do exactly that, is that they estimate, okay, what was the forcing from Mount Pinatubo in 1991, and how much did it cool? And so then we can get the feedback uh, from that. So that is another thing. And people, it's kind of amazing that all these different ways find numbers that are pretty similar to each other, uh, but just not similar enough to be able to narrow that initial uncertainty that I was talking about. But right, Hansen's models were actually pretty good on Pinatubo, as I recall, right? Because they, they ran the, the models they had at that point, and that did a fairly decent job over the next couple of years when the uh, stuff was up there. Yeah, yeah. So that's right. always I mean, that was sort of can... a classic first. Hey, we got, but these models are actually are okay. Yeah, and especially when you can you know predict an outcome without knowing the answer first. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, in terms of validating the models and having a forcing function like Pinatubo or something, yeah. or 9/11 was a great one. Uh, do the eclipses give you some kind of uh, data points, or is there any other thing besides that that can give you data points? Um, I never thought about eclipses. Um, Why, they're too short events? Or? 
What's the reason for that? Considering things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think. So you're it's saying because like it's something about the, the system. Yeah. I mean, any any small perturbation is what an engineer loves to take a look at how it affects the system. Right. Right. And that's one. It's an impulse response. It's an impulse response. Yeah. But that's like 9/11 or uh, or Pinatobo. But all these, even if they're micro pulses, that still gives you validation points. Yeah. So something else that's used is just the seasonal cycle, right? You have this, you have large forcing over the seasonal cycle, and you have temperature changes. Um, another one is just using uh, El Ninos and La Ninas. So um, naturally, when you have an El Nino, the, the temperature of the Earth goes up by a couple tenths of a degree, and so then you can, again, you're you're trying to figure out what this sensitivity is based on, okay, when the temperature increases naturally, what does that do to the flux at the top of the atmosphere? And so we can use satellites to try to figure that, um, or to measure that, and then get an idea of, of sensitivity that way. So yeah, the seasonal cycle, kind of these natural ups and downs in terms of year to year uh, variability. The eclipse thing is interesting. I mean, if you look at like the path of totality of the solar eclipse, it's so small that like I don't know how analogous that would be to to the situation with um, global warming, where that's you know the CO two is such a well mixed greenhouse gas that's going around the entire planet. Where in this case, if you're cooling locally, and I'm not sure how much it does cool locally, but it was that's cool. Just it was cool. <laughs> change. It was about a ten degree drop. Okay. Yeah. 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 So you're going to change uh, the circulation a lot, um, but. Yeah, I don't, maybe maybe there is something there with you know if you put an eclipse in a model and saw how it reacted versus. Well, a dual example that I like is in something like 1956. There are two crowns of solar sunspots all the way around. That the northern hemisphere ring, the whole ring around, in the southern. There must have been uh, much more radiation than any of the other typical averages that average type models. Okay. So one could have looked at the dynamic effect in '56, whatever. Yeah. So that just gets back to you know loving to have more data, right? We'd love sure. to have. Well, that's one, one, yeah. one way to focus on on rare events in some sense and look how mm -hmm. those can validate your model, right? Not just averages. Right. Yeah. I, mean, I agree with that. Yeah. Most compute things have have, have have pulse. I mean. Not your Gaussian distributions. So right. look for non-Gaussian distributions that can help you validate even the, the Gaussian-like models. Yeah. Well, what about the, you know, the massive release of methane from our our lake in Southern California? Is, you know, correlated that with the uh, increase in methane concentration? Is that how does that crank in in terms of your magnitude of effect? Yeah, so here as well. Um, well, so that's kind of an interesting question in terms of this model development that it used to always be that we would prescribe the greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere because mm -hmm. the carbon cycle or the methane cycle or the nitrous, you know, nitrogen cycle, which has to do with nitrous, nitrous oxide, like those were considered kind of like too complex to even put in a model. So you would just prescribe, you'd just say, here's what methane is going to do in the future. And then if it does that, what would the rest of the system do? Where now there's much more coming online where the carbon cycle is explicitly calculated and the methane cycle is explicitly calculated. Um, and so then you prescribe emissions and then you let the model um, Calculate, you know, how CO2 in the atmosphere would change, or how methane in the atmosphere would change. Um, I'm not sure what the state of the science is in terms of methane. My understanding is that, like, the Siberian methane bomb um, is not something that we're worried about in the near future. Uh, in terms of it, you know, it I guess it depends on your risk threshold. Uh, you know, so if it's a one in a thousand chance or something, is that something that you're willing uh, to? Uh, to accept or not, but I think it's a it's numerically a small uh, chance, but then the uh, consequences would be, would be bad. Obviously. But what's the, what's the susceptibility or the gain factor per part per billion of, of increase in methane? Right. So I think, I think we've doubled at least doubled it since. You know, yeah. So on a molecule per molecule basis, methane is much stronger than right. CO2 at its current concentrations. I mean, part of that is just because CO2 is so, there's so much more CO2 than there is methane. Yeah. 
Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what the radio forcing is for a doubling of methane uh, from current values. Uh, there are other, the other issue is the time frame that you're looking at. So CO2 has a much longer lifespan in the atmosphere, and methane will decay essentially into CO2. Um, yeah. So if you're just looking over 10 years, then the methane you know, spike would, would have a lot higher amplification relative to CO2, where then over longer time periods it gets less. Is, but, does methane, is it a straight exponential decay in, in the models, or is it... No, I don't think Stranger. it's just, I don't think it's assigned, you know, some type of a half-life or something. It's actually calculated. Like, so the, there's a chemistry module that's going to be calculating um, how, you know, how much methane there is based on a number of factors. But yeah, I, I don't know the, the details of that. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it, it used to be a case where it would just be, you know, assigned some decay function. But now they're more sophisticated than that. Is that it? Um, it's kind of fun to jump into philosophy. Uh, <laughs> is your field's biggest problem the lack of, of the last half percent of precision, or is are there bigger problems, political and such, that make all of this irrelevant in terms of actually having an impact on the global debate? So do you mean, I mean, like, I'm mostly interested in these questions just from a scientific, you know, perspective. And I think uh, most climate scientists are. Um, you know, just the way that you go to any science department, people are really into their problem for no particular reason other than they're just interested in the problem. <laughs> um, and so that's how I feel about this. Um, I guess, are you saying that, like, that people in the field are political? And that, and that that's a problem. Or are you saying that the oh, oh, oh I, I don't know exactly what I'm thinking. In general, engineering and science tries to understand the real world so that you can do something about it. That might be one. Oh, I see. Yeah. And you know, you you study computer architectures, so maybe you can come up with faster computers. Right. You study global warming, maybe because you're hoping to affect global warming. But it may not be possible to change that. It may not be lack of precision or detail. That may not be what's preventing people from having an impact. Yeah. Right. You may already know enough in that light. So No, that's certainly true. Like changing these um, our results relative to the previous, you know, results doesn't really change the big picture. And so any any type of political uh, motivation to do something about climate change shouldn't really change all that much. Well, um, back in 1970, Keeling's last slide, which I remember, was the amount, the horizontal axis was the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere by a given study. And the vertical axis was the number of dollars. And it was practically a 90% correlation. And he, he, you know, this is again, this is before Al Gore by a decade. Right. He, he pointed out that we have to be mindful of the fact what our results say when we publish a quantitative figure like this with respect to getting funding for what we for what we want to study. Yeah. I mean he analyzed all this stuff and it's the same same problems that we have now. Well yeah, I would just say that like I so this is what our results show, right? That we get more we project more warming than uh, than the previous results. And like it's clear that that is a result that certain groups like to hear, right? Because it advances um, an advocacy uh, type stance. But I just want to say that like I would have been just as happy if this was on the lower end because it's either way it's showing that we're gaining information uh, about the system that we didn't have uh, before. So I think it's dangerous to kind of, if you're a climate scientist, I think it's dangerous to come at this problem of like I only want to show results that will motivate people to change their actions or to do something politically because that's going to that's going to bias the results it's going to make it so that um, you're not a good uh, truth finder and so i i never want to look at the problem that way where where if i were to find that this red line was below the dotted line that i would be somehow hesitant to publish that or something because that would mean that uh, people would uh, think that global warming is less severe because my motivation is just to get at the truth um, and not to, um, you know, advance uh, an agenda.
And you know, I think it's it's really important that people say that because the whole, you know, a large part of the United States is very skeptical of climate change science, and they're skeptical specifically because they think climate scientists are just activists um, pushing uh, a political agenda over uh, science. And so I'm, you know, cognizant of that and I'm very careful, uh, you know, investigating my own <laughs> thoughts on that and trying to make sure that I'm not uh, doing that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.